Well, welcome. Today we're going to talk about bonding in molecules. Take a look at this interesting molecule right here. This is called glucose, okay. and it's a really important molecule because it keeps you alive. It's the sugar that feeds your cells. Okay. Now, how do chemists know how the atoms are arranged in a molecule like this? We're going to start today with a very simple approach, and later we'll get into theories that are more sophisticated. Well, before we start, we really need to talk about covalent bonding. Now, covalent bonds result from the sharing of electrons between atoms, and in this sense, they're different from ionic bonds. Bracken, how do ionic bonds form? Ionic bonds form when one atom will transfer an electron to another atom that needs one. Good. Now, in covalent bonding, as for ionic bonding, we talk about the atoms wanting to obey the octet rule. That is, the atom wants to obtain the configuration of the closest noble gas. Now, the question arises, which elements on the periodic table would want to obey the octet rule by sharing electrons? And we can take a look here and notice that it's the elements in the upper right-hand corner, the nonmetals, excluding the noble gases. Let's take fluorine, for example. Now, uh, the closest noble gas to fluorine is what? Um, neon. All right. Uh, for fluorine to get the neon configuration, what does it need to do? It's going to need to obtain an electron from some other atom. Yeah, now it could do this by taking an electron from a neighboring atom which is willing to give an electron up, take sodium for example. But what if the neighboring atom doesn't want to give up an electron? What if it also needs another electron to satisfy the octet rule? Well, in that case, they can both satisfy the octet rule by sharing electrons. And that's the principle upon which covalent bonding is based. So in the spirit of cooperation, they could share electrons and thereby satisfy the octet rule. So, as an example, why don't we use fluorine itself? Bracken, how many valence electrons, or outer electrons, does fluorine have? Um, let's see. Seven electrons on the outside. How could you tell? I could tell by looking at the periodic chart and counting across until I came to the fluorine. That's right. We count from the left, just like this. So now we can show those seven valence electrons around the fluorine atom. Let's say another fluorine atom comes along. Okay. It also has seven valence electrons. Now if we bring those two fluorine atoms together, they could share an electron, like this. And now each thinks it has its octet. Do you want to check that? Sure. The first fluorine has eight electrons, and the second fluorine also has eight. That's right. Each now thinks it has eight. And this is how a covalent bond occurs. The two fluorine atoms associate with one another to share two electrons so that each can satisfy the octet rule. And these two shared electrons form what we call a covalent bond. So in the process of describing the bonding of one fluorine atom to another, we've accomplished a couple of important things, Bracken. Uh, what are they? We've predicted how fluorine really exists in nature as an F2 molecule. Right. And in fact, it's important to remember that when atoms bond together this way, they form what's called a molecule. And what's the other one? We've learned how to draw Lewis dot structures for molecules. That's right. Now, let's be really clear what a Lewis dot structure consists of. First, we represent each atom in the molecule by its symbol. Next, we use dots to represent all the electrons in the valence shells of the atoms and how they may be shared to form bonds. In fact, Bracken, what's special about the two electrons in between the two fluorine atoms? Those two electrons form one bond between the two atoms. Mm -hmm. There are two electrons, but they form one bond. 
It turns out that there is a simple procedure for drawing Lewis dot structures which works almost every time. Here are the five steps in order. First, we count the total number of valence electrons in all the atoms in the molecule. Second, we count the total number of electrons needed by all atoms to obey the octet rule. Third, we take the difference between these two numbers, and this gives us the number of bonding electrons in the molecule. That is, the number of electrons that will appear in bonds. Fourth, we place the bonding electrons between the atoms. Fifth, the remaining electrons are called non-bonding electrons. We assign these to the atoms so that each can obey the octet rule. Now this is all probably as clear as mud at this point, but as we do a series of examples in the following slides, hopefully all will become clear to you. Okay, well, let's look at the formation now of a binary compound. Uh, let's remind ourselves, what is a binary compound, Bracken? A binary compound is composed of two different elements. Right. Uh, do you have a favorite binary compound you'd like to try? Um, why don't we try HCl? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, here's HCl. Now there are two atoms in HCl. Uh, if we look at the periodic table, we can decide how many valence electrons are uh, in the molecule. Uh, Bracken, how many does hydrogen bring to the table? Hydrogen has one valence electron. And chlorine? Chlorine has seven electrons. Okay. So the total number of valence electrons available is how many? Is eight. All right. Now, we need to decide how many valence electrons are needed by the elements in the molecule. Let's take them one at a time, Bracken. Okay. Hydrogen. Hydrogen will need two electrons to achieve the electron configuration of helium. Right. And, and how about chlorine? Chlorine. Chlorine will need one more electron, so it'll need eight total electrons to achieve the electron configuration of argon. Right. Good. So the total number of electrons needed in the molecule is two plus eight, right? Ten, yep. Ten. So the next step is to take the difference between the valence electrons we have and the electrons we need. What is that difference? That difference is two. Good. And two then represents the number of electrons that will be in bonds in the molecule. Let's put those two electrons between the two atoms like this. Now, how many, rep how many bonds does uh, that represent, Bracken? Those two electrons represent one bond. Good. Now, what about these remaining electrons? What should we do with those? Um, we probably ought to put them around the atom that needs, that needs the electrons to fulfill its octet, or its valence electron. Sure. Which is that? That would be chlorine. Right. So, we put the electrons, the remaining electrons, around the chlorine atom. Um, Let's check if the two atoms now satisfy the octet rule. You want to do that? Sure. Hydrogen has two, and right. chlorine has its eight. Good. So they're both happy. <laughs> okay, now let's look at oxygen. How many electrons are there in the oxygen valent shell? Well, any mammal could answer a simple question like that. Let's ask Fido over here and see if he knows. Right, Fido, the answer is six. Next, how many electrons does each oxygen need to obey the octet rule? Well, of course, that's eight. So, how many additional electrons does each oxygen need? Fido? That's right, it's two. Now here's an opportunity to learn how Lewis dot structures can help predict bonding. We'll use the O2 molecule as an example. Notice that our starting point is knowing the formula of the molecule. We know that oxygen exists as O2. First we place the two oxygen atoms side by side. Next we count the total number of valence electrons in all the atoms. There are six in each, so the total is 12. 
Next, we calculate how many electrons would be needed to satisfy the octet rule for all atoms. That's 8 each times 2 is 16. Next, we take the difference. And this difference magically gives the number of bonding electrons, that is, electrons that appear in the bonds. Now we place those four electrons between the oxygens to form the bonds. Note that since two electrons make one bond, four electrons represent two bonds. So we say oxygen molecules are held together by a double bond. The Lewis dot structure is not done, though. We still need to show where the other non-bonding electrons go. We place these in pairs around the atoms so that each has satisfied the octet rule. Notice that in counting electrons, each oxygen counts its own non-bonding electrons plus the four electrons in the two bonds. Now take a second to reassure yourself that each oxygen really has eight electrons. By the way, there's another way to depict bonds in Lewis dot structures. We can replace each bonding pair with a line. Either way, dots or lines is equally valid. As another example, why don't we do the Lewis dot structure of water? Now, everybody knows the formula for water, right? What you might not know is how the atoms connect together to form the water molecule. Here we introduce a general assumption you can make when doing Lewis dot structures, and you're given a formula like this. Unless told otherwise, we assume that the single atom sits at the center with the others bonded to it. In the case of water, we assume oxygen is at the center with each hydrogen bonded to it. The rest is the same old routine. Why don't you hit pause, try it yourself, then see if you got the right answer. We have four bonding electrons, but we have to distribute them between two bonding regions, one pair between oxygen and each hydrogen. So use two for this bond, and two for this bond. Each hydrogen is now satisfied. And the remaining electrons distribute themselves around oxygen to complete its octet. Great. Now, as our last example, let's do the Lewis dot structure of formaldehyde. That's the liquid they store those dead frogs in you dissected in high school biology. Here's the molecule's formula. And here's a hint. The hydrogen atom and oxygen atom are all bonded to the central carbon atom. Now, again, hit pause and give it a try. This time, we're going to show you the whole process to music. Hit it, maestro. Now, wasn't that beautiful? Of course, we could represent each electron pair by a line. Now you have the basics of Lewis dot structures. There are many more nuances that you'll want to explore with your teacher or in your text. Remember, if you want to see any of these Lewis dot structures again, just go back and view that slide again. And have a great day. <laughs>